different stuff. Um, and we've also had much more serious emails. Here's an example. I think a lot of people will understand this completely. I'm 52. I'm a single mother of a girl of 18. I've got asthma and another immune issue. I'm in the middle of the virus and my daughter now has symptoms as well. She has a boyfriend. He wants to come to see her. She wants to see him. We've had a massive row. It was unpleasant and left me in tears. Basically, I'm being told I'm the worst person in the world. There'll be so many situations like that and my heart goes out to that woman and please do keep emailing the program. But we do want to hear how you're getting on, how you're dealing with all these challenges. Now this is a really interesting interview with uh, Camilla Pang, uh, a young woman who at the age of eight was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. She really struggled to understand the world around her. She is now 26 and she is Dr. Camilla Pang. She has a PhD in biochemistry. Her book, Explaining Humans, What Science Can Teach Us About Life, Love and Relationships, is an attempt to take us inside her head, a place where so-called social norms are pretty tough to fathom. In terms of me feeling a little bit like an alien, I say a little bit, I mean complete like an alien, you just don't fit as if you've been plopped in the middle of nowhere, you're like, it doesn't feel right. I was very young, to the point where I was probably four or five really, and that's when I really felt it. I was very frustrated as a, as a child because it's one of the miscon um, misconceptions about people with autism not having, that they, they can't express themselves. But I think actually it's hard because it's almost like everything's boiling underneath the surface. But to have the skills to communicate right now takes a lot of work, takes a lot of processing. Imagine if you didn't have any filters. Imagine if you didn't have any outlet, but you felt it all inside. Wouldn't you end up banging your head against the wall? So I think a lot of people with autism have this innate bubbling underneath the surface. In terms of having a formal diagnosis, I was eight, and this was actually something that was mainly for my mum, my family, and my teachers, that they knew what was going on based on the research at that time and the books, so that they knew how to help me best. When my mum, my mum never, never really told me that I was autistic. She never used the label because she knew that I just wouldn't, you know, I'd be indifferent to it. I'd be like, all right, un unaffected because I'm still going to carry on being me. Yes. Uh, would, would it be fair to say that you retreated into a cardboard box or you just spent time in a cardboard box? Um, so yeah, so when we moved house, um, there was a massive cardboard box that I absolutely loved. I made a home in a cardboard box, and happily so, the feeling of enclosure in a symmetric, confined space is just fantastic. Especially as it's an environment that is almost like, this is my own world. And you see it, and you're in it, and it's just absolutely lovely. It's almost like an isolated system and that you have control over, apart from your mum feeding biscuits. Yeah, I was going to say, she did find a way to... Yeah, I made me. a cat flap. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you keep the cardboard box for? Um, I think when I had my new room, but it was quite hard to win me off it. I, I absolutely loved it. I think I used it as a den. My mum's like, you can still use it, um, but still, when you sleep in here, you sleep in your normal bed, but you can still go in, go in it whenever you want. And I think having that freedom, her accepting me, yeah, she likes cardboard box. With it. Your mum does sound absolutely brilliant. She's is is what she did the right way to be with a child who has autism? Yeah, she nailed it. And she read books, but she didn't do it to the letter. She did it by knowing her own child and having no judgments as to whether her child is sleeping in a cardboard box or feels the need to entertain herself for four hours by pushing a wheelbarrow around the garden. She's like, well, Minnie's happy, I'm happy. And if she's safe, then that's great. For example, um, I feel it's accepting what the child likes and she could be doing something, she could be playing with Barbies. Brilliant. Wouldn't that be ideal? My daughter plays with Barbies. But no, I absolutely loved pushing the wheelbarrow around the garden. There's no other reason, just because. And I think it's having the lack of judgment and open-mindedness, but then calling them in as, as, as if, there's no social preconceptions of what she's doing. I think she na she nailed that, in, and yeah, she nailed it. Um, do you know why you went to boarding school? Yeah, so um, it was, I think there's like two, two or three main reasons. I think the first that comes to mind is the fact that I um, I needed routine. I like the structure. I like the you know I like the smaller classes and the uh, ability to have a mentor. But when it came to the boarding element of it, I. Commuting. I still don't like it to this day because 
why would you want to leave your home comfort to an uncertain sensory overload of social nuances? And when I found out that my bus driver in question, um, he smoked and he smelled, I was like, that was it for you. I was like, I'm all right. I'm not going on that. And I was like, you need to go to school. And so we, so over time, I went to boarding school and I absolutely loved it. There were teachers that loved me and I loved them, but there were other ones um, that, that, that didn't. And I think I was quite um, polarizing because if I liked you as a teacher, I liked the subject and I connected with it, and it was great. But I think when it came to learning, um, because I made these models in my head describing human behavior and also when we learn science itself, and also maths. And when I see something that didn't quite match, I thought if I knew a theory that was beyond what I'd been taught, or I had my own different interpretation of it, I found that actually really hard. And it's hard to get through as a teacher to be like, no, mate, it's like this. I'm like, yeah, but why isn't it like this? And they're like, but it, it's like this. And I'm like, no, I've, d I've done my analysis. <laughs> and so I think from a teacher point of view, to break it down to its discrete fundamental, um, principles step by step really helped and I think what boarding school was useful for is that everything was spoon fed you eat at a certain time you exercise at a certain time everything's allocated but um, actually reminiscing of that makes me realize how much I need that as an adult because as much as be oh you want to make time to do painting in the evenings but me I'm like am I am I hungry it's 3 cpm I I feel like I should be hungry, but I'm not. And sometimes you don't know what you need. And I think that's one of the hardest parts of which I do miss still from school is people telling me what I need when and why. Because yes. you, you, you 